Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, my story's just begun. And fail you won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Yeah, fail you won't define me, cause that's what my father does. On this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, my story's just begun. And fail you won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Yeah, fail you won't define me, cause that's what my father does.
Lord, it is a, a very deadly virus. Lord, for some folks and others, yes. Not as bad as they were pronouncing doom and gloom and the end of the world as, as they were in March, but yes, there are people that we know, people that we love that have passed away from it. And Lord God, we do pray that you will bring about a healing of the nations, that you will speak a word and you will bring an end to this virus in such a way that you will receive the glory that no politician, no scientist, no doctor can claim, I found a cure, that it will supernaturally disappear so that the world may know that there is a God in heaven and know that he still interferes out of love in the affairs of men, even in a sinful, fallen world. Lord, we pray that you will do it for your glory and our good. Lord God, we pray also that you will bring a healing of our nation, of our souls. And Lord God, that you will help us to let go of the anger, the bitterness, the hatred, the politics, Lord God. And that we will be united through a great revival because you are the great uniter. When we are born again through your blood, empowered by your spirit, it doesn't matter who or where we're from or who we are because we have the great uniting salvation that comes to humanity through Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for salvation. Lord, we do lift up Megan's mother and the, the Crane Vaughn family and pray for peace for them. We lift up Pastor Brian and his family and pray for healing for them and also healing of their souls, of, uh, of their hearts, Lord God. As they mourn, Lord, we know there is a, there is a there is a mourning in their very soul as they, they mourn Brian's mama, who was just a very sweet, godly lady. Lord, just bring peace and joy to their broken hearts, to the mourning in their soul, and turn it to joy, and also bring healing to their bodies. And Lord God, continue to be with, with Lowell's family. And Lord God, just give them peace and joy and comfort, knowing that that Bud Mull is with you. Because, Lord God, he showed who he followed and who he served every day. But Lord God, we ask now that you will bless this, this time together. That, Lord God, that you will allow us to sing songs that will praise you and that will glorify you. We pray you will anoint us to bring glory to you. And I pray that when I stand, that, Lord, you will truly move me out of the way. And that, Lord, you will speak through your spirit, through your word to all that hear. And that we will be changed, that we will be rebuked, that we will be saved, that we will be transformed, that we will be guided, that we will be whatever needs to be accomplished in our souls, Lord God. That tonight, Lord God, you will accomplish it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Join us now as we worship.
Folks, we do have one more announcement before we get started today. Tonight, today is Dwayne's birthday and Miss Trula Crowder's birthday. And we just want to say happy birthday. And folks, I want you to know something. Um, through all of this, Dwayne has been here ready to, to lead music, to encourage us to sing songs of praise. And I want you to know, Trula has been right here with us. Amen. She has, has driven up and been here to play the organ. And we just want both of y'all to know how much you are appreciated. And, and I just want to tell you, it has truly, truly been my honor to serve the Lord alongside of y'all. And I'll be honest with you, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else than to be right here with y'all. I want you to know that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you tonight to ask for your wisdom, for your guidance, through your spirit and your word to be given out to us all. Lord God, let your word come forth and accomplish all that you mean for it to accomplish in the hearts of all that hear. Lord God, we pray that we will be different after we hear your word and your power. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, folks, I've got to be honest with you. I spent all day today bringing things that I have been studying on together for this because this was not the sermon that I had planned for tonight. Last night, in the middle of the night, the Holy Spirit woke me up and just very much let me know that this was not what God wanted to have brought forth, the message that he wanted brought forth to his people tonight. And honestly, I, I got to admit, I was a little bit like Moses. I wanted to argue with the Lord, you know, in my heart. I, I've already got all this pretty much written. I've got the studying done, yes, Lord, but i got to get it from here to there. And that's one of the hardest things for me, is it's hard for me to get my thoughts from here to paper. Now, it's crazy. You can ask me something, and I can go through and order it and speak it, but to actually get it written down, that's hard for me. So I hit the office early this morning. I started praying. I said, Lord, you're going to have to bring to mind all the things that I've been studying on for all these weeks and months and speak to your people tonight. And I want you to know, folks, I believe that the message that the Lord has given tonight is for somebody. It's for somebody. I mean, really, in a greater sense, it's for us all. But there is somebody in particular that the Lord wants to reach tonight. And I want to encourage you to listen diligently, to ask the Lord to open up the eyes of your heart. Well, last Sunday, we learned from the Word and from the Spirit about what true repentance really is. That godly sorrow, repentance, leads to life and that worldly sorrow leads to death and we talked about what that entailed we looked at 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 10 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 10 where the word of God says for the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation but the sorrow of the world produces death. We learned that the chief characteristic of worldly sorrow is that it is fundamentally self-centered. It's all about me. It's all about me. It's all about how I feel about the pain that I'm experienced or the failure that I've, I've engaged in or how my sin has affected me and, and you know the results of it on me or even the results on people I love, but it's all about me. And it doesn't lead to Jesus. We learned that worldly sorrow always seeks to eliminate the pain and very often the consequences on our own terms rather than to deal with the pain and the sin and the consequences on the Lord's terms. We saw that godly sorrow always leads us to Jesus and focused on the Lord and our sin against him and our desire to be right with him and forgiven by him. And you know, sometimes when we're struggling, either because of sin that we've committed or just the fact that the sin that's in this world has clobbered us and, and we're hurt. And you know, sometimes we just feel like the Lord is so far away. 
Now, sometimes, to be honest, sometimes we bring it on ourselves through our sin. But sometimes just sin in the world affects us and it brings pain and it brings sorrow on us. The question is, how does God turn worldly sorrow into godly sorrow? The question is, can we do it? The answer to that is no. No. We can't. But he can. The question is, how? How does God turn worldly sorrow into godly sorrow that leads to life in us? We're going to answer that question tonight. Turn in your Bibles to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verses 6 to 10. James chapter 4, verses 6 to 10. We're going to take a very commonly known verse, but we're going to show how this connects with the repentance that leads to life. James chapter 4, verses 6 to 10. But he, meaning God, gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Well, how does God turn our worldly sorrow into godly sorrow? Into salvation. Into his grace and power and mercy for everyday living. Well, it starts with one thing. God's grace. God's grace. Look at James chapter 4, verse 6. But he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Grace can basically be defined as blessings that we do not deserve. Folks, I mean, you know, we all understand this. If we work a job, if somebody tells us, if you'll go do this and do it this way, and I'll pay you X number of dollars, then if you go and do it the way they told you to do it, then you expect them to pay you X number of dollars. And you should, because that's just right. It's fair. It's just. You've earned it. The thing about grace is, God's grace is none of us have earned. It is strictly from his love and his mercy. And we need to realize and accept that we are totally dependent on God's grace grace for everything in this life and even beyond. We're dependent on God's grace, God's mercy. God's grace is man's only hope. You know, and part of our worldly sorrow is that we try to stop our pain to fix things on our own power. But the truth is that we cannot do anything that really matters spiritually except through his power. Yes, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. It's amazing the things that people can do, the things that, that mankind can figure out. But at the end of the day, we can do nothing that really spiritually matters in a godly way except through his power. And his power comes to us only by his grace. None of us have ever earned it. There is only one that has ever walked this earth that lived a perfect life before the Lord. And his name is Jesus Christ. And that's what made him able to be the perfect sacrifice, the lamb without blemish, for the sins of us all. We need God's grace for everything. For salvation. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. We're saved through faith, and we are saved by God's grace through faith. How is it God's grace? And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. God's grace is gives us the gift of salvation, gives us the gift of saving faith. We, don't, we can't even work it up on our own. 
He has to give it to us. Not as a result of work so that no one may boast. You and I can't say, well, I built up my faith to the point that I accepted Jesus Christ. No, the Holy Spirit was working within you and gave you that. So that you could. We, we just fail to realize God's grace. And how much he loves us. How merciful and kind he is. We thank him for his Holy Spirit that brings salvation. God gives grace greater and greater when we stop being so proud and stop trying to say, I can handle it all on my own. I can live my life my way. When we humble ourselves and admit, I need that's why in James chapter 4, verse 6, it says, But he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud. The man that says, I will do good works and save myself. No, you can't. We are saved by faith, not of works. You can't save yourselves. Our works are like filthy rags before the Lord. God is opposed to the proud. He's against the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. The key is our pride. And folks, that is one of the key things about differences between worldly sorrow that leads to death and destruction and godly sorrow that leads to life. It's pride. God opposes the proud. Those who think they can handle life's problems, those who think they can handle sin's pain, sin's penalty, through their money, through their own work, through their wise thinking. Those who are proud and resist the wise counsel of the Lord, they resist the Spirit of God, will find that the Lord will resist their efforts to solve their own problems and to remove their own pain. He will resist it. They will remain in their worldly sorrow that will lead to destruction. Folks, I'll be honest with you. There's been times where I tried to live my life on my own power. And I've got to be honest, nothing seemed to go right. <laughs> nothing seemed to go right. And finally, I bowed on my knees and I said, I am wrong, God. Forgive me of my pride. Forgive me for me thinking that I can take care of my business. God, I need you. Have mercy on me. Forgive me. Give me wisdom. Give me guidance. Show your mercy and your favor on me. <laughs> and it's amazing what happened. Those that humble themselves. Those that admit that they have sinned. Those that have admitted, I don't have the answers. Those that admit that I need you. To these people, God will give his grace. Those that humble themselves before him. And then you break down and verses 7 to 10 shows what godly sorrow, what humble repentance looks like and actually does. You, see, you remember we talked about that godly sorrow always leads to us pursuing the Lord? James chapter 4, verse 7 says, Submit yourself therefore, or submit therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Look at this. Submit to the Lord, number one. The word there in Greek, submit, means to line up under a military commander. It's like the idea of establishing an old-fashioned skirmish line. But basically it's a military term used to describe soldiers who are lining up under the authority of a commander and who are willing to and, and, and will obey his commands. In other words, submit yourselves therefore to God. In other words, line up under his leadership and his authority and stop trying to handle life on your own terms. Now a few verses back it says, you know, that God says to stop trying to do things under your own power, that we need his grace. 
Well, now he says, stop trying to do things, living life, dealing with sin and pain your own way. Deal with it my way. Submit to me and my will for your life. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. The Lord's got a will for everyone's life. And there is no plan that God has for his people that is insignificant. But I also want to tell you something that's frightening. Satan has a plan for everybody's life too. And he will do everything he can to get you to follow his plan rather than God's plan. God is saying, here, submit to me and my will for your life. To do that, you have to let go of your pride and allow yourself to submit to him. Pride is a big portion of worldly sorrow that leads to despair and leads to death. And folks, can I be honest with you? A big part of that pride is where you are just devastated, where you are just broken. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe that I did that. Where I, I just can't forgive myself. I, I just can't forgive myself. My sin is so great that God cannot forgive me. Now, folks, can I tell you something? All those things really sound good, you know? Boy, you know, boy, he's broken. Boy, he's upset. You know, man, I'm telling you what, he is just all torn up. It sounds good, but folks, to be honest with you, it's really a form of pride. You know, my sin is so great that God can't forgive me. I kind of touched a little bit on this Sunday, but the idea that everybody else in the world, their sin can be forgiven, but my sin is so great. Basically, you're kind of putting yourself up and saying that, that my sin is greater than the blood of Jesus Christ. My sin is so that Jesus could take care of everything else but take care of this. And folks, to be honest with you, I mean, that's a form of pride. It's kind of a twisted form of pride, and we don't really recognize it as a form of pride, but it is. Basically, God here is saying one of my favorite phrases. Stop the frantic panic. <laughs> you know, stop trying to run around, trying to fix yourself, trying to fix your life, trying to take care of your sin your way. The Lord says, submit to me. But now, how do you submit to the Lord? Well, we're going to be looking at this as we go down through here. But what does it mean to submit to the Lord? It means changing your focus, your spiritual orientation from yourself and the things of the world to being spiritually oriented on Him. Now, you hear me talk about this a lot because I want you to know this is a common thread that is woven through Scripture. From everything from Jesus saying, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. It's all kind of the same thing. But there's just kind of common threads sometimes. For example, I don't care if you have a motorcycle. I don't care how many wheels it's got. You might have three. I don't care if you've got an, an SUV, a Corvette, a big old jacked up four-wheel drive. What's the common thing on this? They all have they all have tires on them, right? It's a common thread. You know, I used to have a friend that's, that sold tires over in Greenville. And, and I've done business with them ever since I was a little boy. Just like whatever you have that has tires, if you drive them, they're going to wear out. And if you don't drive it, they're going to rot out and they're going to have to be replaced. It's kind of the same concept, folks. Spiritual orientation has to change and get off of ourselves and get off of the world and be focused on the Lord. Your thinking, your words, your actions, your attitudes, all refocused on Him. Seeking Him as your King, your ruler, humbly falling under His rule. He is the commander of your life, obeying out of love and reverence for who He is. It is seeking Him as the satisfaction of your soul. Not just looking for somebody to make the pain stop or to get you out of trouble. What happens when we submit to the Lord? Let's we'll look right there in verse 7. Submit to the Lord. When you do that, then the devil will flee. But what does that really mean, the devil will flee? 
Well, what it means is when you line your life up under the Lord, Satan has no power over you. And he will leave because you are not moved by him. And by, by the way, his temptations will go with him. Okay? He will flee literally, and his temptations will have no more power over you. Resist here in the Greek literally means to take your stand against. Again, the idea of you're, you're preparing yourself, you know, for action. You're ready for the fight. You're grounded. You have a firm foundation. When you stand empowered with his power through his grace, then you can resist. You can stand against temptation. Always remember this. When you are born again, Satan's power over you is broken. And at that point, the only power he has on you is the power to tempt you and to convince you to sin. Or to convince you that, well, it's okay. You know, they, they say it's sin, but it's all right. My sin is really okay. That is Satan's only power over you. Yes, now you struggle with the flesh. We all do. The habits of the old life. We struggle with the world around us that's constantly trying to draw us in and, and make us feel like that we're weird or we're different. <laughs> Don't work on me because I've been weird and different all my life. I mean, I'm used to it. <laughs> I'm just kind of like, yeah, that's just normal for me, you know? <laughs> but that's what the world does. It tries to make you feel weird or different. It wants you to kind of go in and get, you know, do what everybody else is doing, you know? I was always the kid that, you know, everybody went this way and I went that way, you know? Just, you know, I've just always kind of marched to the beat of my own drummer. You know, and if any of you doubt that, talk to my wife. She'll do. Okay? But when we line up under the Lord's kingship, then we can stand against temptation. And the Holy Spirit continues to tell us and shows us now how, to, how he transforms that worldly sorrow into godly sorrow. Because the way it starts is through God's grace. When we humble ourselves and admit we need him, when we stand up, when we lined up, when we submit ourselves to God, when Satan flees because we have made that, and then, James 4, verse 8, then we draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-hearted. Draw near to God. That is a command. When you have... Submitted to him and the devil has fleed, has fleed from you. Then draw near to him. We draw near the Lord through, and the only way we can is through his mercy, his grace, through the blood of Jesus Christ. We draw near to him, being near to the Lord. And he in turn will draw near to us. I'm going to share something. I, I don't know if I've even shared this with Bonnie. Um. One year, at one of the churches I was, a, I was pastor of, we did BBS my very first year there. And I walked down, and my wife was teaching the three-year-old class. Well, I didn't know it at the time, but there was a little boy there that his mama was being very, very mean to him. And I never will forget, I came in just to say hello to the kids, kind of like I did here last year. You know, I, I, the reason I don't teach a class is not because I'm not willing to, but I just kind of want to float around and, you know, pop into classes and say hey to everybody and, you know, just get to know them. And I never will forget this little guy. He was standing up there with his little hands kind of folded like this and looking down. And I was talking to everybody, and I noticed that he just kept inching closer and closer and all of a sudden I felt his little head right here on my pants and that little guy just inched closer and closer to me and I looked down and he looked up and all of a sudden he smiled and I just put my hand on his little back and I said Bonnie I said who is my friend here and she told me his name and I talked to him and he, he wouldn't talk but he would, he, would, he would nod yes or nod no and I'll be honest with you there's not a whole lot of weeks that go by that I don't think about that little fellow. 
And then later on, I found out that his mama was abusing him. And he was looking for comfort. And I guess I came in, you know, with my boots and my jeans and my, my shirt on. And, you know, I guess he realized that I was a dude and I was a man. And he sought comfort. He drew near to me. And when he kind of came up here, I, I didn't pull away. I, I drew closer to him to comfort him. And you know something? Ever since then, when I read this verse, that's what I think about. I think that when we draw near to God, out of love and out of grace and mercy, he draws closer to us to tell us it's okay. I'm here. It's all right. You're okay. When, when we through his grace draw near the Lord, he promises he will in turn draw near to us. When we humbly repent and recognize that we need him and we seek him, he will find us. He will draw near to us. When we are right with him, when we long to be with him, he will come and be with us. This is exactly what we see in Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 to 11. Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 to 11. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God through his grace on the basis of faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. That is exactly what he's talking about, drawing near to God and he drawing near to you. But drawing near to him requires that we, in James chapter 4 verse 8, we cleanse our hands, we sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Cleanse our hands. Repentance means not just admitting that your way, your sin, is wrong. That's a good first start. But true godly sorrow means turning and leaving the way you are living. It means leaving your sin. Cleanse your sin. Admit your sin. Seek forgiveness for your sin. Then turn away. Cleanse your hands. Purify your heart. Washing your hands is a symbol of the external change in your life. Cleansing your heart is symbolic of the internal change in your life. By seeking forgiveness. By letting him cleanse your hands, your life, and purify your hearts and follow Him. What is a purified heart? A purified heart is a heart that thinks, that focuses on, that acts like the cleaner of your heart, the Lord. It doesn't enjoy sin, and it's grieved when it sins. Can I be honest with you? One of the surest signs that you're a Christian is when you sin in private and nobody but you and the Lord knows about it and you just flat out don't enjoy it and you're really embarrassed and you're broken over it and you're just like, you know what, Lord? I can't even enjoy the stuff I used to enjoy. That's a good sign, okay? If you still enjoy it and there's no, there's no conviction, you need to really find out whether you really are in the faith. You don't enjoy it. Why? Because a clean heart, a purified heart that is clean on the inside, that's, that's, that's represented by a clean life, clean hands, is not double-minded. A clean heart's not double-minded. In other words, it doesn't have one foot in the kingdom of God and one foot in the world. 
Okay, one foot in his church, one foot in the world. You can't serve two masters. That's exactly what Jesus is talking about. Now, I know you're going to say, well, he's talking about money. Well, yeah, it is. But basically, you can take this first, Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the other and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. You might say, well, Jesus is talking about money there and the love of money. Yeah, he is. But you can apply that to every spiritual thing. You cannot love Jesus, and you cannot love whatever is in his place, whether it is greed, whether it is violence, whether it is anger, whether it is bitterness, unforgiveness, whether it is sex, whether it is a pity party where you're just enjoying being, oh, the whole world is against me. <laughs> whatever it is, you cannot... Stay double-minded where you have one foot in one world and one another. You can't serve two masters. Something is going to control you. And it's either going to be yourself and the world, or it's going to be the Holy Spirit of God through your will, empowering you to do it. But something's going to control you. you have to, we have to choose who we're going to serve. Because you can't serve two masters. You can't serve two masters. Ask any mother that is constantly trying to please her husband and her kids both at the same time. You can't. You have to choose one or the other. Moms know exactly what I'm talking about when the husband's pulling on her on this arm and the kids are pulling on her on that arm. My wife one time said, I am not a jungle gym. Huh. You know, come on. Just, everybody just give me a minute, you know. Moms understand that. You have to choose who you're going to serve and who you're going to follow. Let's get back to, to being double-minded. When you try to do both, you're double-minded. What does the Bible say about that? Well, it's funny you ask. Because right here in the book of James, chapter 1, verses 6 to 8, the Holy Spirit says through James, somebody's asking, believing, asking God for something, but he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. Why should he not expect to receive anything from the Lord? Because being a double-minded man, he is unstable in all of his ways. The double-minded person is basically one that says, I believe and I trust in the Lord. Well, most of the time, but, you know, it just seems to make more sense that, you know, I do it this way over here when I'm doing that. I know a lot of people like that. I've had people tell me, well, you know, I, I, you know I'm a part of his fellowship. You know, I go to church and I read the Bible and all this. But, you know, at work, I, I can't do that. I can't do that. You know, I, you know, I, I just wouldn't work at work. Dude, you're unstable in all your ways. You know, sorry. You want to teach Sunday school? Nope. Nope. Because if you can't choose who you're going to follow, you really think you're going to teach people? Always remember this. A disciple is always like their teacher. You really think you're going to be allowed to teach people to be unstable in all your ways and double-minded like yourself? That's just, that's just a fact. A double-minded person can't be depended on. In the church setting, in the home setting, in, in the, really even in the work setting. you got to decide who you're going to choose. God makes it clear that when you're double-minded, you should expect to receive nothing from him. You have to choose. And guess what? And every morning when your feet hit the floor, or at 2 o'clock in the morning, whatever time you go to work, you get up every day, you have to choose who is your king. And I'll be honest with you. If you truly are single-minded, every day it's going to be the same. Repentance is not turning from your sin today and then indulging in your sin tomorrow. That's being double-minded. And that is not true repentance. That is the sorrow of the world that will lead to destruction. Now here we can also see the emotional aspect in here. Godly sorrow of true repentance. Here in James chapter 4 verse 9. 
Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your, and your joy to gloom. True godly sorrow is spoken about here. Now understand, I'm not trying to say that it's all an intellectual or, or, or merely an intellectual and a spiritual thing. There is an emotional element to it. Both. That's why it's called worldly sorrow and godly sorrow because there is a brokenness. We looked at Judas last week. Folks, Judas was torn up. Judas was broken. He wasn't going around flipping in coins in there and smiling his face. <laughs> Y'all can imagine that. I think I'm going to go out and hang myself. Thank you very much. He was broken. He was broken. He was devastated. But again, it was all self-focused. I can't believe I betrayed an innocent man. I cannot believe. Yeah, he wasn't the Messiah that I was looking for. And yeah, I don't, but you know what? He has done nothing to deserve to be on that cross, and I did it to him. I cannot believe I did that to him. True godly sorrow, there's got to be a brokenness. Your heart is broken over your sin and how it has offended God and how it has hurt others. How you have lost your witness. You know, Jesus Christ paid for our sin. Three hours on the cross. Think about this. All of eternity compressed for all that ever did believe by faith and have believed after by faith. For all those people, eternity compressed into three hours. Have you ever stopped to think about this? When we're saved, all of our sin, our past, our present, our future is forgiven. Now that doesn't mean that we still don't need to seek daily cleansing, daily forgiveness, but it's different. We go to God the Father as a father, and we receive forgiveness as a child from its father. When we are saved, we receive forgiveness as God, not as our father at that point, but as the king of the universe, as God the, the judge who says, boom, not guilty, your sins are forgiven, and we receive judicial forgiveness. But daily, we get parental forgiveness. But you know, I don't, I'll be honest with you. When I think about my sin, what if my sin was what kept him on that cross one more minute? Because I chose to do this today. What if I stand before the Lord? And yes, I'm forgiven, but what if my sin kept him on there for one more moment that he had to endure punishment for my sin because I take my sin so casually, so cavalierly. Well, it's no big deal. It's under the blood. I think that's a lot of our problem. We don't take our sin seriously because we don't think about the amazing sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us. You see, when we are truly repentant, we have a God-centered morning, not a self-centered morning. Like, God, I cannot believe that I did this to you. When you're saved after all that you've done for me. And when we, we're being saved, God, I cannot believe I've done this to you and you've been so good to me. Forgive me, save me. Weeping is an external sign of that inner mourning. It's an external reaction to the inner desire to be right with God. When we mourn and weep, when instead of taking our sin lightly, it's turned into mourning, and our joy becomes gloom when we realize what we have done. And we count the seriousness of our sin against God and against others. And what happens when you have true repentance, when you're truly out godly sorrow? Look at James chapter 4, verse 10. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. We go right back to the beginning where we started in verse 6, do we not? To humility. To the fact that God helps the humble. but he fights against the proud person. He fights against him. He resists him. He says, nope, you ain't gonna, you're not going to do this. You're not going to be able to achieve what you want. 
And we've looked at just what defines the truly humble person. The humble person is the one who submits himself to God, who acknowledges their sin before him, who seeks his grace, who seeks his mercy, who seeks his forgiveness, who seeks his cleansing, who stands and resists the devil if by falling into line under the Lord is their commander. Folks, one of the key differences, again, between worldly sorrow that leads to destruction and death and godly sorrow that leads to life is the difference between pride and humility. That's one of the key differences. And, and the thing about it is pride is so subtle. It affects us in ways that we don't even recognize it. That's why we have to ask the Lord to examine our hearts for us. Because God is the only true heart knower. Not only can I not know another's heart, but really and truly, I can't really even know my heart unless the Lord makes it clear to me and helps me to understand. Yeah. Pride is so subtle. It blinds us to our own sins. It blinds us to our own mistakes. Pride, if you'll stop and think about it, was the first sin when Lucifer, the worship leader of heaven, said, I deserve to be on that throne. I deserve to be worshipped. I desire. And in a moment, the most beautiful angel was transformed from Lucifer into Satan, the adversary. And we all know what happened next. Awards fall in heaven. He and a third of the angels fall. He tempts mankind and we lose our stewardship of the earth and death and sin enter into this earthly realm. And man is separated from God for our sin to the point that only God can make a way back for us. And fortunately, he loves us so much he does. Pride. Let me ask you some questions. Does God seem distant to you right now? Let's be honest. We all go through times of pain. We all go through times of pain. Sometimes it happens in times of great turmoil and pain. Sometimes it happens in times of great joy. And, and, and honestly, I'm going to tell you, an old-timey preacher once told me, and I think he's right. He said, for every 10,000 men that can handle hard times and hurt and pain and stay humble and to, with the Lord, there's only one man that can handle success and God's blessings and not get full of pride and pulled away from you. Does God seem distant to you right now? The question is, what's going on in your life? Is it because you're suffering the pain of this world? And it may not be pain of anything you've done. It may be that you're just suffering just because there's sin in the world. Could be that you're undergoing a spiritual attack right now. Let's be honest. It also could be you're reaping what you've sown because you have sinned. And now everything, that house of cards that you built is collapsing in on you. And it's not too much fun. It could be any reason. But the question is, what are you going to do about it if God seems distant? Are you willing to humble yourself before him and to cry out that you're hurt? If you have sinned, are you willing to repent of your sin? Confess it. Repent of it. Turn away from it and turn to him, either for salvation or for sanctification, to be made more to the image of Jesus. Folks, everybody's hurting over something. Honestly, I could stand here right now and I could name 50 things that my heart is broken over. We all could. Some of it is things that just happened because we live in a sinful world. Some of it is because of my own sin. And I'm just reaping the benefit of the consequences of it on an earthly plane. What's going on in your life? But the 
bigger question is what are you doing about it? Are you seeking Him? Are you submitting yourself to the Lord? Are you falling under His authority? Are you standing firm so that Satan and his temptations will flee from you? Are you cleansing your heart? Are you drawing near to Him? Are you allowing your heart to be cleansed through Him? Have you humbled yourself before Him? Or have you turned, are you still trying to deal with your pain your way? We, do, we try to do everything in the world, from drugs and alcohol to money and sex to, you know, I don't know, I mean, you know, you know, plastic surgeries. I saw a thing on TV the other day where a man, or where a woman who says she's a man is married to a man that says she's a woman, and the woman who says she's a man is expecting a baby. And they're billing, and they're billing it like a TV show. My husband is pregnant. No, ma'am. No, sir. Your wife is pregnant. If you were born a woman, you're a woman. If you're born a man, you're a man. These folks are trying to use something to feel the pain in their hearts. Yeah. And they've chosen that. Where are you turning? To deal with your pain are you drawing near to him or are you trying to take care of your own business there is a worldly sorrow that we try to remedy ourselves through drugs through sex through money through whatever that leads to death and there is a godly sorrow that leads to Jesus and leads to life where is the path you are on taking you. Go to the Lord tonight and ask Him for wisdom and discernment on your path. And draw near to Him. Humble yourself before Him. And choose Him. You'll never regret it. We sang earlier about what a day that will be. Folks, as long as we're in this world, there's going to be pain and there's going to be hurt. The innocent are going to suffer and the guilty are going to prosper sometimes. The wicked come out on top and the godly seem to be trampled. Sometimes. Good things happen to bad people, bad things happen to good people. That's because we live in a sinful, fallen world. But when you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, not only do you have what it takes to make it through this life, through His mercy, power, and grace, but through His mercy, power, and grace of such a great salvation, He has given you what you need to make it into the next world where there will be no more tears, where there will be no more pain, where there will be no more sin, where there will be no more struggle. When you are born again, you are saved from the penalty of sin eternally through the blood of Jesus Christ. And when we go home to Him, we are delivered from the very presence of sin. Where there are no more tears, the presence of joy. Hope in this world and hope in the next. What are you hoping in? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord God, it is, it is my sincere prayer, God, that you have been glorified through your word. Lord, it is my sincere prayer, Lord God, that your word has impacted somebody that needed to hear this, whether it was someone that's here with us tonight or someone that needed to hear this through the virtual live stream. Lord God, my prayer is, there, is there anybody that does not know you, grant them the repentance, the godly sorrow that leads to you. Save them, Lord. And Lord, if there's anybody that does know you, but they're walking a guilty distance, they're trying to deal with the effects of their sin or the effects of sin upon them through their own power, God, convict them. Lord God, humble them. Help them to realize they cannot accomplish it, that they need you. And Lord, help them to turn to you and allow your Holy Spirit to bring to them a great salvation or if they already know you, a sanctification. Lord, sometimes you don't take our pain away. 
but you give us joy and peace even in the midst of that pain. Lord God, work whatever needs to be accomplished in the hearts and minds of all tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Folks, join us again this Sunday morning here at the church or online as we gather together here or through the virtual live stream to worship the Lord, to enjoy and celebrate such a wonderful love and the great mercy and his word. May God bless you and keep you, and we'll see you soon. Good night. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, my story's just begun. And fail you won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Yeah, fail you won't define me, 